Hey everyone, uh, good afternoon. <laughs> it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Burcu Akinci to you today. She joins us uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, where she's a full professor uh, in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Uh, she's also the uh, Director of Engineering Research Accelerator. Uh, she is a very well-established, uh, well-awarded, well-funded researcher. Um, and beyond these, she has several awards. Recently, she has been she has received 2020 and 2021 um, Computing and Civil Engineering and Automation in Construction Awards. Um, she is very well known in the research community for her contributions in both uh, domains, computing in civil engineering and automation in construction. Um, beyond those, she's a great role model, an excellent mentor, and um, I'm also proud to say that I'm uh, one of her <laughs> uh, graduates as well. Um, a lot to say about her, maybe something to add personally here is uh, she's a proud mom of uh, three kids. And also, uh, maybe a proud telephone mom as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd like to uh, uh, leave the floor for Burju. Uh, this will be an exciting uh, talk as well. I have heard a lot of presentations from Burju. Every time I hear uh, her talks, there's a new dimension she always brings it. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy the conversation. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Emilia, for the great introduction. And, and all the awards are due to my brilliant students, right? Yeah, so I, I don't get any credit for those. So um, thank you for having me here. This is my first time ever and, you know, on a work trip. And, and this is my sabbatical. And I said, first place I want to go is NYU uh, to see all the great work that you're doing here. So, so I'm excited to be here um, to talk about some of our research. Um, just a little bit about Carnegie Mellon. So, our campus has a little bit different feeling than NYU. This is our campus. It's a very small campus. And this is our campus on a beautiful fall day. Uh, October is a great time to visit. Um, nowadays, when I arrived here yesterday with a 17 degree weather, and you told me that I brought Pittsburgh weather. Uh, yes, I did. It tends to be cold, but you can take me that I didn't bring the clouds with it. So typically it's cloudy and cold. In Pittsburgh at this time of year, but October is a, is, is a great place to be. The reason that I'm showing our campus is that we do make a lot of collaborative research, and we do, uh, and we take advantage of our small campus to do that. So everything that I'm going to present is actually not. As, I don't think I have a single PI on any of the projects that I'm going to present today. It's a collaboration of either faculty from with faculty from civil engineering or robotics institutes or electrical and computer engineering. Um, a little bit of, about Carnegie Mellon, I'm giving these just to give you a context of where I'm coming from, because that's that's basically how I see the world. Uh, we are really big on computer science and AI, and, and that's actually embedded in everything we do. So uh, as you're gonna see in the next slide, you know, our Civil and environmental engineering department is, is, is a bit different. We don't have traditional, you know, well-known construction program, for example, but we have something called advanced infrastructure systems. And it entails, you know, smart facilities, smart structures, smart transportation. Our environmental group includes air quality, climate change, sustainable water, and environmental decision support. We don't have a structures group also. We have mechanics, materials, and computer group, which is looking into mechanics, data science, and materials. So this is you know, where I'm coming from. Just to give you, a, again, a little bit more context of the, of the work that I'll talk, um, I'm a third generation civil and environmental engineer. Uh, we, uh, this is all my family. Everybody in that is in that picture is an engineer. My kids didn't go for civil, but uh, my dad, my granddad, they're all civil engineers. My mom is a civil engineer. Um, my brother is civil engineer, married to an environmental engineer. I'm married to a civil engineer, but that is a civil engineer. So the bottom line is that civil engineering is everywhere. So the reason that I put this is not to brag about my family, but also uh, to say that I'm born and raised here and I see the world as civil engineering, civil and environmental engineering centric. 
I think that we do a lot of cool stuff in CE, and, and, and that's my bias. So I want to put it out there as my bias. So I did my PhD at Stanford. Coming from Turkey, I didn't know a whole lot about computing. And when I did my PhD, I discovered the power of virtual worlds and BIM. And I came to Carnegie Mellon and learned about sensing. And since then, I've been kind of working on this merging sensing and building information models. Um, about four or five years ago, I co-founded a startup called Lina Pan Technologies. I do have a couple of slides on that. Um, kind of see the, how, what it takes to turn the research to a, a sellable product. And it's, I realized that it's not that easy either. So not the topic of this talk, but happy to chat in any of it, any one of you is interested in the startup world and entrepreneurship. Uh, there are unique opportunities, but there are lots of challenges along the way too. So I'm happy to chat about that at some point if you're interested. So where do I start? This is basically a similar start, slide that I used for, for many, many years in uh, the starting slide on my talk. Well, I'm always baffled by, you know, when you look at some simple decisions that we may try to make in civil and environmental engineering becomes very challenging. For example, figuring out, you know, where are the deviations in our, um, in our construction? Where is the valve to shut off water? When there is, you know, when there's a sprinkler system, uh, the breakage and, and things are being flooded, uh, or how well is my HVAC system performing? These are should be fairly simple questions to answer, but uh, when it comes to uh, our facilities and our construction projects, it's very difficult to answer. And these are not engineering problems. We have excellent engineers. These are basically information problems. We don't have we cannot provide the situational awareness to our engineers to make the best decisions. And hence, these things, which should be easy to answer, becomes very challenging to answer on, on the day to day, day, day activity. So, of course, we also want to go beyond, you know, traditional, you know, being able to go, answer those traditional asset management. We got to go from these reactive ways of doing this to more proactive and predictive. Go away from subjective assessment of things to more objective. Go away from making decisions with limited information to enabling complete situation awareness. Go move away from making decisions per single system towards interacting, you know, cyber physical social systems, right? Our systems are not just standing alone on its own. If we have cascading failures that impact the communities around it. And in an ideal world, we should be able to do these autonomous. Right? We've got to move to those directions autonomously. Then we say, well, where are we in the autonomous spectrum when it comes to built environment? So I'd like to kind of typically compare that to cars who make that leap. You know, car, a medium sized sedan has 400 sensors. This, everybody treats the cars nowadays as giant computers. So when you go to a mechanic, they don't just immediately come with a hammer, they come with a diagnostic software system, hooks up your car and understands what's going on. And then, you know, autonomous cars are here. We're seeing them on the road these days. When it comes to buildings, we make it, we make them smart, right? We have equal, even more sensors, like 21,000 data points in a 60,000 square foot building. But then we don't treat the buildings as giant computers. We treat them as just a regular, you know, regular hammer, you know, way to do the manual diagnosis. I mean, so we rely on manual diagnosis when it comes to facilities and you know, autonomous buildings. Uh, we want to get there, but we're not quite there yet because we haven't jumped through this intelligent diagnostic steps yet. We still Think buildings at, at bricks and mortars rather than giant computers. So, this little problem of manual diagnosis uh, is actually results in 4% of world energy users. So, we're basically wasting 4% of the world's energy on the fact that we just do manual diagnostic. Uh, that translates into $50 billion of energy waste in the US. And you know, twenty thousand dollars of annual energy waste for a 
small to medium sized building, 50k square foot building. So you might ask, well, why are we there? You know, what's wrong with civil engineers? Mechanical engineers already figured this out. Well, the, the, the thing is that when it comes to buildings or infrastructure systems, uh, we have very unique challenges that, that the cars don't have. Uh, we have, as you all know, each building is unique. And, and we also have very complex uh, control logic implementations to, to manage our interdependent building systems within the buildings. And the same components also behave very differently within the same building. So, for example, here is an example of a control logic implementation of it, this very simple AHU. And this is what it looks like at the end. At the at the back end on how to how you control this, and you might think of this that you're applying now this to multiple air handling units in the building, and each of them has a different kind of loops and control logic in terms of where it gets deployed. As a result, you know purely data driven AI solutions don't well work well for most of the work that we're doing. So this is C six rooftop units, or that we have had access to of a, of a single building, same building, same location, six different units made with same manufacturer. So we trained the model for fault detection with one of the units. Guess what? The first one. And then we tried to see how it got transferred to the other units. And as you can see, it's, it's, it wasn't easy to transfer. And the reason for that is that the context under which these rooftop units are used are very different. So they behave very differently, even though they are the same manufacturer and the same building. So, uh, so that's, that's a challenge for autonomy, right? If you want to create one algorithm, data-driven algorithm and apply to all the rooftop units, then that would have been solved and we would have, been, we would have gotten close to more, uh, more of this autonomy in the building. Of course, you just add to that, you know, changes in the that occur in the layout, uh, usage throughout the building's life cycle, and then the owners being very deeply involved in these. Um, and you know, I always give the example. Let's say you got a car. If you are really involved, you change it to an SUV and then change it back to a sedan. You know, we, we, we do that for buildings, but we don't do that for. So we just take them as, as we don't change the shape or the context of the car uh, the way we change the building. So that is an extra challenge to the analytics and autonomy that we can bring. As a result, this whole thing that the context matters, right? So we can't just like get a data-driven approach and apply it blindly to the buildings or the infrastructure systems. We got to put them in the context of usage so that we can come up with some accurate and reliable uh, results. So when it comes to context, right, the, there are many data sources that are available for us, anywhere from building information models to sensors that are embedded in the facilities to you can take, it, take a 3D imaging and take it out there and do a scan in five minutes. You have a hundreds of megabytes of coin swap data or just you know textual data that uh, field workers collect or work orders, etc. Those are all available for us to create this context. So basically, you know, in our research, what we have been doing is building, you know, utilizing building information models to build the context for analyzing this data and using this data to bring reality, you know, to update our building information models. So at the end, we do have in the middle something called living information model or a, you know, version zero of a digital twin or version one of a digital twin, that's a model that gets continuously updated with the sensor information. So that's basically the gist of, you know, our research, what our research has been in my group. Uh, we, I classified the majority of our research questions into three. How do we create these digital twins when you don't have any data? So in those cases, when you don't have any you know, models that are already in place. So in that case, we have done uh, work on real capture with digital models, and I'll give you some examples of them. 
The other one is a single data source never is going to provide all the information that you're looking for to create situation awareness. So you've got to be able to fuse data from heterogeneous data sources. So we've been working on data fusion approaches and, and how do we even represent these you know, living information models. And then the third category is, well, we got to support the decision, right? So how do we drive actionable information? And we have done work on visual analytics, not getting into more detection diagnostics than root cause analysis, getting into more prescriptive maintenance. Haven't, we haven't reached all the way to predictive maintenance yet, but that's the goal in terms of where we're heading. So uh, in terms of how do you create the digital twin, my research team has been working on you know, a lot with points to them. Recently, a little bit on images to BIM, and we also did a little bit of work on symbols to BIM. So I'll start with the points to BIM with a, with a research that got founded about seven years ago. So this is more on, more on the older side of the research um, that was founded through NSF National Robotics Initiative on basically generating a, a, a practice for an inspector. So, and this apprentice happens to be a drone, an autonomous drone that does the aerial mapping of a bridge. So this is a collaborative research between the Robotics Institute and within Carnegie Mellon, as well as the Civil Engineering Department at Northeastern. So in that research, we said we have where a group of folks who are interested in more on the robotic side of things, you know, how do we create this autonomous, John who could fly out uh, without any pilot and and become this apprentice. Uh, we were also we also had a group who are interested and I was part of that group interested in okay you get the point cloud data how do you turn it to an actionable information and then how do you bring it in an environment where you can do some immersive inspection and assessment without needing to go out to the site. Think about the fact that nowadays inspectors go once in two years to bridges and try to manually do these by themselves and shut down a bridge for six weeks to be able to inspect only one portion of that bridge. So the goal is with this with this tool, you know, with this apprentice done, you know, they can do much more frequent data collection. They can also do uh, they can also do a more comprehensive data collection. So here's what the what the robot looks like. So the interface is that the inspector basically puts a bombing box on the bridge that they want to in, in, in inspect. And in this case, uh, this is the autonomous uh, drone. Uh, and the goal of the drone is to fill that bombing box as much data as possible without hitting any obstacles. So all of these voxels, what it is trying to do is to collect, you know, uh, data, in this case, point cloud data, as well as video streams, while not hitting, you know, any parts of the bridge. So they had a bunch of challenges in the robotic side for this, because when you go under the bridge, the GPS is down. How do you localize it in a GPS United environment? When you're turning around the bridge, there are all sorts of interesting wind tunnels. How do you keep the drone stable uh, as you're kind of navigating through the different parts of the bridge? As you collect the data, basically, this is what you get that you get a point cloud that is built online. Uh, and once you have the point cloud, then you can start doing some analysis. And if you find, let's say, a place that requires a bit more, uh, a bit more. The data collection, and we have seen in the first round, it basically does a sparse data collection to get a general sense of the area. And then the inspector might say, Hey, I'm seeing something funny on this section to a much more detailed and much more accurate data collection. In this case, the goal, the goal of the um, of the drone becomes I'm gonna I'm gonna collect as detailed, you know, as 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 dense of a coin plot as possible. Again, without hitting any object on that section of the of the building, as you're gonna see in a minute, what it does is it actually navigates between the girders of the bridge to be able to collect the data 
about that particular deck. So you see now the, the drone basically flying in between tanks in the bridge, uh, underneath the bridge to collect the data. So with that, you get a much more accurate uh, and much more, um, I guess, dense and detailed data collection about that part of the bridge where you can do some defect analysis and classification. Um, huh. Okay, once we get to point cloud, so this was a joint work with robotics institutes and us, but we realized that, well, when I started this point cloud research, that was 20 years ago, um, I thought that uh, computer vision folks were insulting us. Basically, they kept telling me our our built infrastructure is featureless. And I'm like, what do you mean? You know, I'm insulting us because a lot of features. But from their perspective, it's featureless, right? Because all of the walls look alike, all of the, the columns look alike, you know, which text looks the same. It's not like at that point, earlier in computer vision, they were trying to figure out whether an object is a duck versus a rabbit. And when you look at those, they have a lot of features, but these don't have that many features. So what we have done is we use a hybrid approach. Yes, we did have you know data-driven um, segmentation of things, but in terms of classification of what we're seeing, we brought in the domain knowledge and then combined that with that with that data-driven approach to figure out you know what we're seeing in the scene in terms of you know columns, corners abutments, etc. Um, and then we did damage detection. And the idea here is again, without the inspector needing to be up at the job at the at the field and climb under the bridge, etc., they could get a full situation awareness from the point cloud data on on you know the current situation in the bridge. And we also processed it for crack detection and stalling. And those are the red dots that you're doing that the algorithm finds some cracks and, and falling. He or she, the inspector can go and click on one of them and it will take you to the location. And then uh, you can see it in the point plot what the crack looks like, but you can also see it in the image. So you can say, well, wait a minute, this is actually a graffiti or versus a crack. Or it is a crack, and if it's a crack, I can do measurements on it and start classifying what this crack might be. Okay. So you would be able to, again, this is you're doing it on a virtual in setting in minutes rather than, you know, walking around and trying to find these visually and documenting by hand. So that's what the point clouds to kind of uh, BIM or point clouds to defect analysis kind of research. What we have come is that one of my recent students, he just graduated actually, he said, well, there are all these images that are being collected in the field. And these are random images. So these are not collected for progress monitoring or to be able to generate events. There's a ton of research out there that does you know, data collection for updating or generating of a bin. These are not those kind of images, as you can see, because there's no overlap. These are totally random bridges. Somebody walking at the job site on a day sees maybe a crack on one corner or want to document a connection. They just sent a photo and uploaded in this company's website. So this is a project that was built a couple of years ago close to campus, and this is out of their portal. So we said, can we use these to do some kind of an update on the bed? Well, it turned out to be very challenging because as you can see on these images, there's no overlap. There's an intrinsic ambiguity due to unguided data collection. They are totally randomly walking around and collecting data. Repetitive scenes, everything looks very similar. So it's difficult to say, well, this, you know, that stair is in that corner versus some other corner. And then the scene changes over time, right? The construction site changes, what the wall looks like earlier during construction is very different than later in the construction. So what my student did is that he actually tried some of the computer vision based approaches initially, and none of them really worked. I'll show the results of that. 
And so he came and said, well, we well, we got to bring the domain knowledge here. So he said, instead of, you know, trying to do the edges, edge detection, and try to figure out where the image is taken, taken through the edge detection, why don't we first figure out what are the objects that we're seeing in the scene? So those are the, he called, you know, he used the, um, basically an image and turned it into some kind of pro uh, product from prior descriptor. So uh, 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 an array of uh, all the different categories of objects that they see that are seen in this, in this image. And then use that as a way to localize where things are. And it turns out that that approach um, worked well, much better than the more generally known algorithms like SIF, line matching, vanishing point. These are features that don't have domain knowledge, right? They're basically features out of the computer vision. And we tried it in the in two test sets. One is a simulated test set, the other one is a real test set. Test set one is the real test set. And the localization error with the proposed approach is you know significantly lower than the localization error uh, in the other approaches, based on the fact that there were low overlaps. If we had a data collection that was targeting the uh, beam update and actually was collecting a bunch of data that is over a bunch of images that were overlapping, they would have performed well. But for a random set of images, using the domain knowledge as the feature rather than you know line matching or vanishing point turned out to be much more reliable uh, for changing themes as well as uh, you know low overlap between the images. So this is the um, image to BIM uh, example of research here, a recent research that we did. So those were trying to generate this digital twin, right? So the other part of the equation is what we do with it. How do we come up with an actionable information? So I'm gonna go back to the example or the problem that I mentioned about this energy waste due to HVAC fault detection. So you might ask, why is this such a big problem? Here's an example of a fault that never gets detected uh, unless some algorithm is actively looking for it. So you're seeing two situations here of a damper and a supply fan. In both cases, the airflow is the same. So as an occupant, I don't feel, I don't feel any difference. I'm all good. I'm getting the air that I need. In the first case, the, uh, the damper is open 100%. And in this case, the, the supply fan is working 37% speed, right? So all is good. Many cases over time, these dampers start getting stuck. They are mechanical pieces, so they get stuck. So in the second case, if the damper is stuck 40%, uh, in this case, the fan is working 92% of the time to provide the same airflow to the room to make the occupants comfortable. So from a diagnostic perspective, not, you know, since the occupant is not going to complain that they're not getting the same airflow, both of them are the same from the usage perspective. But in this case, you're basically wasting 2.5 times more, close to twice, the amount of energy usage to provide that the same air, right? So this is a fault that should have, could be detected if you start implementing, you know, some, some algorithms that search for these kind of issues. So one of my PhD students, you know, earlier uh, looked into this and said, why can't we detect these faults? It turns out that there are already hundreds and hundreds of fault detection algorithms out there. None of them gets used in practice. And what he claims is that it's because all of these need different types of information. And there is not an approach that brings all the information together to provide this. So we spent a bit of time to work on how do we integrate these multiple sources of information into a single platform 
where now we can run a bunch of fault detection algorithms. And, and his research was on that. So he did that and started, he didn't create a new algorithm for fault detection. He basically created a data fusion approach to run these algorithms. So we turned these into, uh, that's the startup pitch, right? So we turned it into a product um, where we use the digital twin as the, as the background. Same concept that I'm describing, Right, so that you have the digital twin of a pixel here as the background, and then we're running already existing algorithms, and through that we are able to not only do root cause uh, fault detection but also root cause analysis. So um, this is what the interface looks like. You can see it in the bin, for example, where the faults are, and um, not just as I said, it just it doesn't just say oh there is a you know. Uh, uh, an alarm that comes up and say, oh, the value exceeded a certain temperature, it actually tells, here is the reason where we're seeing an issue. This is when the issue occurred. Here is the reason. And when you fix it, this is how much money energy savings you're going to have. Because we could do all of these because we have the digital split or the context behind these AI algorithms. And then, you know, if somebody is interested, and many of them initial users are, so they become skeptical, they want to see where, how this is occurred. So we also provide transparency on where and how this diagnostic is done. So um, again, this is actually, it kind of was a research project for us for two or three PhD students worked on, turn it to commercial, not being used, it's it's interesting. It's being used by like three million square foot uh, of facilities. Nothing, but we're making baby steps. And it's interesting how people kind of value the different parts that that we haven't you know thought about initially in the research. For example, this transparency that comes with it. And I'm going to finish it with a very new research project that is ongoing that is moving this autonomous buildings to autonomous habitats in, in, in Mars and beyond in deep space. So we're part of, uh, part of a center funded by NASA. And NASA, uh, basically it's a science technology research institute. And in the call, NASA asked all the aeronautics engineers to collaborate with civil engineers because they said civil engineers figured this out for well, the smart building on earth they want to do it uh, for habitats in the moon and 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 beyond in mars etc so that's how we got hooked up with this team of uh, researchers from different universities i think we're the we're the only civil engineering representation here however in architecture which which is also very interesting to bring it in into this. So this is a multidisciplinary, multi-university uh, institute. And the goal, the mission of this institute is the development of a smart app that will be semi-autonomous. We don't think it's going to be fully autonomous with learning capable systems because it's going to change over time and teamed with remote and lo local supervision. So local supervision is astronauts, Remote is when they call Houston and say, Houston, we have a problem. Um, and, and with the effect of ever increasing levels of autonomy. So, all the issues that we discovered on Earth, this actually gets worse in the space. Um, I was really shocked, for example, the majority of the time that the astronauts spent on habitats is to fix the habitat rather than doing the experiments that they were supposed to do. So they were actually fixing leaks and this and that in the habitat uh, up, I heard a number like 40%. When you go to the deeper space, uh, the connection with the earth disappears. So when you say, Houston, we have a problem, it will take a while for Houston to hear it and then Houston to respond to it. So now these systems need to be autonomous, be able to fix and communicate with the astronauts because you can't call a friend and say, help me out, we're having some issue because it's the, because of the communication issues there. So everything that we're facing on Earth is magnified uh, in, in, in the deep space habitat explorations. So 
We're looking at the four states of habitats, uh, habitable, uninhabitable, uh, but human safe, uninhabitable, and human unsafe and degraded, basically run away. Well, this is run away, and this is supposed to run away, and see what the autonomy and what the recovery might be in these situations or what the operative operation protocols might be in these four states of habitat. And here are the you know five different research trusts um, in terms of what the functional design of the vehicle is. Our architecture group is very much involved in this. You know, even thinking about the colors and shape, I learned so. I'm really fascinated about this research because I learned so much about space habitat. They say that you know when space habitats are not always occupied, so a crew goes, does some stuff, and then they come back home, and another crew goes. And they said, when you go there, it has the smell of an old house. Like when you, if you go for vacation and if you don't use your house for a month and then you come back, there's that smell. And smart habit, the habitats also have that smell. So they, you know, the architecture folks are figuring out how do you make this, that place is a much more livable, enjoyable, and can be shared by multiple crews, you know, and be a home for them for a while, uh, kind of thing. So. We're working on the self-awareness, what type of sensing and autonomy that we can bring. Uh, we have a group working on human autonomy teaming, you know, because these things, you know, as they become autonomous, they need to team with the astronauts. A group working on the robotics part of it, how do we fix this, how these things self-heal. And we are also working on this, creating a dynamic digital twin to enable all of these to work together. So we're as Carnegie Mellon, we're involved, civil engineering, we're involved in these two parts of the, of the work. So that's, uh, you know, so that's one of the recent work. We don't have a whole lot of results yet. We have three PhD students working on this, on these components. So I'm going to finish by saying, you know, I've been talking about this, you know, context where AI is important. Um, and just want to say that, yes, it is because I love civil and environmental engineering, but it's not just that. People, you know, in computer science also realize that this is important. First wave of AI was all about, you know, experts, rule-based systems, etc. Second wave of AI was all about data. Data, 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 data. And we're just going to do all the synoptics of the data without really caring about the context. Soon enough, they realize the issues with that. It's not extensible. You can't project. You can't do root cause analysis. You can't do prognosis in those cases. So, you know, this is a dark slide, actually. And the third wave of AI actually puts the contextual model, the domain model, at the core of the AI algorithms. So, so you know. Despite my passion, you know, I'm certainly passionate and I see, as I see civil engineering right in the middle, but that's also what the computer science community comes to, came to the realization that we can't just do a blindly data driven um, AI uh, because it doesn't make sense and it's not explainable and all those stuff. So, in conclusion, I, you know, we got to transform the way we manage our facilities and infrastructure systems. Uh, increased situation awareness, prescriptive, predictive approaches, smart systems to autonomous systems. We have we have virtual models, reality capture technologies that help us for that purpose. I do think that we need hybrid AI approaches. We can't just utilize something that is developed somewhere else and easily apply to our industry for most cases. So we got to develop our own and be a leader in, in creating these AI approaches. So that's that's what uh, you know my research has always been about. I say my, but it's really their research. Uh, um, they are the brilliant minds of my students uh, behind everything that I presented. And I just have the pleasure to present it to you. So I'd like to acknowledge all my students. So. With that, um, I'll finish, and I think right on time. Yeah. <laughs> so, Comments, feedback. I have two questions. The first is probably very basic. I don't know anything about your field. How do you convert the points to say a column or a beam? How do you know it's a column? 
So, so it's, it depends on the approach you use. <laughs> In some cases, you basically, so the way the computer scientist does is that first you say, it realizes that I see a cylinder here. I see a box, a rectangular box here. So that's the initial segmentation. Then you need to say, well, that cylinder is actually a column, that cylinder is a pipe, that cylinder is something else. So that comes, in that case, there are two ways to do it. If you have a data set, which we don't, but we're getting there. If you ever have a data set of labeled point clouds, we can then learn from it and say, oh, I've seen something like that before, and here is a, here is a column. Or, we bring the domain knowledge and we say, okay, anything that is vertical, cylindrical, this shape connected to a planar surface is a column. And can you do that manually or you do that automatically? Automatically. Okay, so how would you know that, for example, this cylindrical thing up there is not a struct because this is not an excavation? Well, yeah, so if it is not, so basically the way it works is that. Uh, okay, <laughs> I don't know what that I was means. just looking for something. No, no, I was just looking at like, the, I no, I was looking at the chat. I'm not so I got distracted. There was a I'm chat. Sorry, and I, sorry about No, that's okay. If there's anything, let me know that I need to do that. Um, so how it knows is that it again, it, the way we did it is different than what it is done right now because we have much more deep learning algorithms right now. But the way we did it, even as Lay as five to six years ago. Uh, it's, a, it's a really developing field. The way we did it is we were basically saying, as I was giving the rules in for the bridges, we were saying the same thing here. If we if we see multiple cylinders connected, then it's a pipeline. And if it is in a room, because we know that there are all four walls, we created a room. If it's in a room, it's a pipeline versus. So pipeline. I guess it's kind of like a decision tree. If then, if then, if. Then. Yeah. So it embeds some of the knowledge in the into the into the uh, algorithm. Having said that, we're in a world of you know we're seeing more and more labeled data. All of those might slowly disappear. Uh, the in terms of because now we have trade. We can trade. From the existing data set and say, oh, I see this in somewhere else, and it was a pipe, so it's supposed to be a pipe. Okay. The challenge, <laughs> I'll go back. The, the problem that we don't have it right now, that computer scientists have it, is that they kind of label things for the world. And for us, for this data to be useful, we need to use, you know, labeling that is more standard, like in a format or something like that. Once we have that, I think it's going to skyrocket. But right now, it's that's why it's a hybrid approach, I call it. So there is the data driven part where it figures out segment things of objects looking alike, you know, same shape, cylinders, et cetera. But then the labeling of it comes with the domain knowledge. Okay. So we have a question from Professor Chen Fang who's watching online. I'm going to. See, hopefully the audio works. And just anyone else who's watching online that has a question, uh, if it if you're unable to talk, just feel free to type it into the Q and A, and I'll read it out loud. But let me try. Chen, go ahead. Are you able to say your question? I mean, let's see if we hear you. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, you need to raise the volume. Go ahead. I don't want to mess up. Can 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 you hear me now? Just wait a second, Chen. I see. Okay, say it again, Chad. Yes, can you hear me now? Is it better? That's great, go ahead. Okay, <laughs> great. Thank you. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Akunji, that I cannot um, uh, join uh, in person because I have back-to-back -back meetings. But I, I, thanks a lot for the, for the wonderful talk. I have, I have two high-level, I guess one high-level question regarding the, um, the second wave of AI that you talked about in the presentation. So the data is like the, the, the audio for the second wave of AI and it's benefiting a lot in the uh, commercial world in, in computer science, but we see a challenge in engineering, especially in civil and construction. Um, like Semiha and I was working on a project and we're trying to get data from um, architects, from designers, and that, that's been not easy. So I wonder, um, 
you as an expert in this field must have encountered this problem much earlier than us. So do, do you have any, um, like, can you shed some light on this and how, as a, as a community, how can we work, to t- work together to solve this problem to really benefit from the second wave of AI? That's my first, sec- uh, first question, thank you. Okay, so that was the hot topic in the, you and I talked about this AI Institute for Construction that, that UIUC was leading and we were part of it. And then we had these workshops uh, I, I'm still very much baffled by our industry, I must say, uh, um, in, in that sense, uh, because majority of the topic was, for example, the construction folks were saying, well, the images that I showed before research, right? So they're like, well, those are our proprietary images, and we're not going to share it to the world, or we're not going to share it to a startup company who can actually make use of those images, right? So if we go with that mentality, I feel like we're doomed, and and uh, and you know <laughs> we'll never have the data-driven solution at all because we're not sharing the data. I personally, even in my startup, I didn't face the issue. So I didn't. We hook up for for the startup. We hook up to the building automation system. Uh, of the actually, we do have fairly large hospitals that we work with. And we do have issues, they do scrutinize, you know, IT security, cyber security aspects of things. But nobody came back and say, oh, this is my data, you can't use it in your algorithm, which is going to be creating a useful result for them. So I personally do not associate that because I haven't bumped into it. But I know that in that institute workshop, there were a bunch of companies, they said, we're not going to share the data because that's our, that's our, that's our, uh, whatever, proprietary knowledge, of, which is completely baffling to me. Unless we saw that data share, I completely agree with you that unless we show, saw that data sharing, we will never leave uh, in our industry. This is how I feel. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I guess, um... Hopefully, the industry and the academia can work together, um, um, and uh, so that we can we can we can address this problem together. Um, I, I I guess my second question is re- I'm really interested on in, in the last part of your talk that is related to this uh, um, uh, habitat um, construction, uh, uh, basically extraterrestrial construction for NASA. Because yesterday we we talked about one of uh, my project about mobile three D printing. We think one of the one of the big potential is to to be pl- like uh, sending those uh, mobile robot mobile three D printers to the extraterrestrial environment to do three D printing. But I know from um, NASA a couple of years ago they did this habitat challenge and they're using basically fixed robot arm like fixed gantry based three uh, D printing system. I'm wondering if that is still what they are planning to do, or they have any plan of, of, of moving beyond, uh, beyond that. Uh, we got the same feedback. <laughs> we do have a, a, a person who is a three D printing person uh, out of Texas A and M in the group, and and we literally got the same feedback we got, saying it needs to be a you know single arm, um, you know the the. There's certainly a value for 3D printing, huge value, because if something breaks, you gotta wait for the shipment and the shipment might be more right. <laughs> and, and otherwise you also need to figure out how many spare parts you need to have in place. So it's a huge actually logistic supply chain logistic problem. Again, magnified much more than the earth. Um, uh, but their approach was for whatever reason that I don't know. We got the same feedback on our on our research, saying it needs to be a single, you know, robotic arm, three D printing. Three D printing in space also creates a lot of really interesting challenges because there's no gravity, same as the robotic arm manipulation. Mm-hmm. But again, I'm not the expert there, but I hear from our our group saying that those are, you know, because you can't your current simulation environments, physics space simulation environments, are tailored for Earth. Right, mm-hmm. and and that doesn't those laws don't apply over there. So how do you even create a robotic arm where there is this uh, 
uh, in a different environment where your current typically simulation models don't work. Is what I heard that again, I'm not the expert here, but they were telling those that, that some of the initial challenges are your the, the project. Oh, Thanks a lot for that information. Maybe I should uh, send some of our recent progress to the to, to your team so that you can share with them. Yeah. I said I'm not involved that in that part of the research. Yeah, but but it's an amazing talk. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So about 25 years ago, or maybe 30 years ago, both Barry Gates and the director of the MIT Media Lab wrote documents about what the future will hold. Actually, one of them was called, what will it be? So if I were to ask you to write this document for civil engineering, say, I think 30 years, 30 years from now, what will it look like? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I don't answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, whatever it's worth, they so were at least 70% off. But, uh, well, I, I actually, I do get asked that question, and I always, so much. The reason is that if we ever, I always say in 2010, we were doing all these 2020 plans. There was this magical thing that was going to happen in 2020, right? We were doing strategic planning, road mapping, road, you know, construction automation in 2020. And here we are. We have a completely different world. So my, my answer to those questions is I don't know what the future will hold. I'm sure we'll redefine many parts of civil and environmental engineering, right? You know, you will redefine transportation for us a little bit. It's just the, you know, the modes of transportation. We might have very different definitions of, you know, water delivery services that we provide might be completely different. Um, but what I know is that we need to adapt, right? That's what I learned over the last few years. And, and to me, that's why you got to have these autonomy or smartness and adaptability into everything that we're designing, building, and operating. Um, so that, you know, as these new things come, we can adapt, you know, our built environment can adapt to that. So that's as close as I'm going to get to the question. I had a question on your um, the technology, the building system. You showed an RTU picture. Uh, I'm curious to know if that was just localized controls or how you're connecting that to building controls. Because you could control the damper and the coils, but if you're not working on central equipment, then you're not saving some energy, right? True. So, so the, the one that I saw showed you was a lot of air handling unit yeah. control system. And that is one of many air handling units that are in a building. And you can imagine that the current, you know, sequence of operation building controls incorporates all of them, which makes it much more challenging and much more spaghetti looking. I do not, in my research, ever, you know, in my research, I have not looked into, which is something that we should, but we haven't really gotten a chance or something to do it, is to interplay with, between building different building systems. So we were very much focused on the HVAC system. An HVAC system in the building part, not necessarily in the children's land. Um, and, uh, and, not, and we haven't looked into the interplay between, you know, the lighting and elevators and together with HVAC, for example. Yeah, so you're just, it's just a specific system that you could cycle. Like, yeah, single building single system. Yeah, right. Now. What were some of the challenges when you went back to the hospital to implement this? Because I do a little bit of hospital work too. Okay. And we never, the, the way it's done, they're never running it that way. And it's still better. <laughs> it, so we take, so what we do is, because we have the digital clip, so we don't just rely on the rules that were given to us. So we also simulate the environment and learn from the simulation. And, and part of the kind of reasoning that we do is through that. But you're right. We so what we have we call it a one month onboarding period or so, or it can be more than a month depending on the customer. What we show is the result, and then they in some cases they say, well, we did it on purpose. I know it's a guaranteed sequence of operation, but we did it on purpose for that specific reason. Once you 
they correct that in the system, the system learns from it. So, so it's a continuously learning system. Uh, what we haven't done that I'm very proud of is that we haven't had any false alarms, right? Because it has the context DRM behind it, there hasn't been any false alarms that we have generated so far in the in the in the system. We have generated alarms that was true per sequence of operation, but that was false per preference, and that they can they can overwrite that. Thank you. And if you, for example, if I install that, like work with you and do it on my facility, two years or five years from now, I change one area to change the occupancy of the localized, not changing the unit. How would the system adopt to that? Yeah, so we have had that case. Uh, somebody actually who was trying to, a, a manufacturer of a bad system, we found all sorts of issues in, in one deployment. They went and changed, uh, you know, they were fixing things. While they're fixing things, they changed them. They didn't change the occupancy, but they changed all of a sudden certain sensors disappeared, certain control points disappeared. What the system did is system basically said there's something really weird happening. And, and we said, we're not seeing the matching. And then we backtracked and, and figured out that they changed something that never got communicated anywhere. The system doesn't automatically say, oh, you know, this now changed to this. It just says that there's a change and I don't know what to do with this anymore. Uh, and now we have then it's a more of a manual inspection right now to figure out what happened. Thank you. Uh, so if I understand it, your that software that you showed is a basically a basis for continuous commissioning. Yeah. Yep. And so, uh, what about the next steps? So, uh, is it going to be capable of recommending retrofits, replacing more efficient equipment, things like that? It, <laughs> or is it already doing it? So yeah. no, we're not doing that. Okay. Uh, we're not, and we're not changing anything with the. Oh. We just basically say you already have this data and you're wasting energy. Let's just fix it. Okay. That's, a, that's the extent that we we went. Okay. The next step, what we are hearing is uh, people would like us to, you know, do a complete autonomy, right? They they basically most of the facility operators want these things to disappear without them thinking about it, right? And and for us to do that, we got to close the loop in many cases, and it says the control logic and start changing things on the control logic. If it is a, if it's not a hardware failure, if it's a hardware failure, unless we have, you know, self-healing components, we won't be able to fix that for now. Uh, but that's the desire to to make these completely autonomous, so that you know the facility managers don't think about it, right? They operate, they fix by themselves. They want the problems to disappear. We haven't, we're not anywhere close to it, of course, but that is. If you ask what the demand is, that's the demand that we're hearing. Last question, maybe? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, could you talk more about your pathway from like lab to commercialization? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what is that your interest in and how much that? Quick, quick, quick story is pathway to commercialization is you got to have a really excited student who wants to do it because I would never ever do it by myself. I had a student who was really passionate about this, and he actually changed his career to become a faculty, uh, you know, operator engineer for a few years to get the hands-on experience after PhD, and then formed the company because we could really see points. We uh, the the our pathway has been using NSF SDIR. Uh, we got two phases of that, and then a lot of seed funding from angel investors. Private uh, angel investors? Hmm? Private angel investors. Private angel investors. So we raised close to a million or more, actually, 1.2 million through the private angel. And SBIR was the only government program? Oh, uh, NSF one was the only one that we applied, but one could have also applied with a little bit, maybe DOE or even NASA funds, these kind of things. The one that we applied that truly made the company was a NSF SBIR. It's a great program. They do a lot of mentorship because the way you sell it is very different than the way you describe it. <laughs> so uh, you're going to go through a lot of mentorship.